Stones Hill. How we doing? Good. I um, hope everybody has have a good uh, Fourth of July weekend, Independence Day, and uh, I want to do something right now with it being the weekend, the the Fourth of July weekend and stuff. Um, those that have have served or are currently serving in the military, would you please stand up? There's one that's standing up that uh, that should that is not standing up that should be. Faith. <laughs> Everybody, every, stay standing up, please. Now, uh, police, EMS, firefighters. Anybody that is has been or is a policeman, a firefighter, EMS. I want to thank you guys for your service, for your time that uh, you uh, spend away from your family and each day and years possibly. So, again, thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Also, uh, a group that doesn't get recognized very often, um, those spouses or family members of the ones that have served or are serving, could you please stand up? Anybody? Served in the past while they were in the service? Uh, policemen and firefighters, EMS also, the spouses, please stand up. Because I'm not sure that people realize um, the sacrifice or the worry or the concern that these people um, face each day. Uh, in the case of the military, uh, years upon end, sometimes they're, uh, they're a single parent for years. So uh, I just thank you guys for all that and having to, you know, each day do you worry that they're going to come home, um, the military and uh, the police. So I just thank you guys for that and standing beside you, the ones that have served. Thank you. So, with, with this being, again, Independence Day, I, I went back and I did some research on some early Independence Day celebrations. Um, some of them have been forgotten. One, um, which I can see why it was forgotten, but before the Revolutionary War, um, colonists and everybody would celebrate by holding a, um, they would, celebration for the king's birthday. Well... As you can imagine, after Independence Day, uh, they actually held uh, mock funerals for the for the king. That was kind of I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty fitting. Um, but you know, some of them kept on, you know, the picnics, the fireworks, and the parades, and different things like that. But one that I didn't know and is still being held on, uh, being carried on today over in New England, is uh, they would on July 3rd they would build big bonfires. Okay. Use everything they had, whatever they had, they build them. Well, the record-setting one was in Salem, Massachusetts, and they used big wooden barrels like this right here. Okay, so a wooden barrel uh, is is about 28 inches in diameter, 35 inches tall. Well, the biggest one ever made, and you know they didn't have a picture of it back then. You know, kind of hard, but it was 40 tiers tall, 40 40 these barrel, barrels tall. Back then, I don't know how they got it that high, but that's about 116 feet tall or the height of an 8 to 10 foot story building. Um, and here's one of recent they used with skids. I'm not sure what that house on top of there is for, but I probably wouldn't be using it for anything. Um, but either, either I'm going to have to start the tradition around here or I'm going to have to go out, and, out east and see it because that's something I wouldn't mind mind watching so um, so as I was praying uh, in the coming week in the last few weeks of what I was going to uh, um, speak on I had thought of the theme of uh, independence you know how God frees us and we're independent from all our different things and but it just it wasn't going that it wasn't going the way that I thought it would so um, God put it on my heart to uh, talk about legacy. Um, and that's something that's near and dear to my heart um, as I've got a legacy that has passed down to me 
and one that uh, I don't want to mess up, you know. Um, so, so here we go. When you think about legacies, what your first thought, you think, you know, you think big, right? What are some big legacies that we've had? Well, we've got the civil rights movement. You got um, Martin Luther King Jr. who had a dream. And Rosa Parks, she just wanted to ride on a bus, right? She just wanted to ride. Um, how about presidents that have uh, carried, had carried, brought this country through some uh, dark times? Like Abraham Lincoln uh, during the Civil War time. Franklin Roosevelt um, carried us through the Great Depression. And then, of course, Ronald Reagan, who helped end the Cold War. Um, then you've got the music side of it. Where would music be without Elvis, the king of rock and roll? Um, or Johnny Cash, the man in black. I mean, I don't think you can talk to anybody that uh, doesn't respect these three. Aretha Franklin, who's a queen of soul. Um, how about the ones that changed sports history? Got Muhammad Ali, right? And they call him the Louisville Lip, the champ, the greatest. You know, saying float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Uh, and then you got Babe Ruth, the salt and the swat, a great bambino, and of course Dale Earnhardt, the great intimidator. Woo! Got a Dale Earnhardt fan over here. So, but take these three here. You can, of all the recent sports and athletes and stuff, it always goes back to these, these, you know, these three. You can talk about boxing. You can talk about all these other people, but it always goes back to Muhammad Ali. Um, baseball. All these people that broke these home run records and stuff still goes back to Babe Ruth. And Dale Earnhardt, he's one of a, he was one of a kind, and... So, uh, how about some uh, legacies that uh, history seemed evil or uh, negative? You got Joseph Stalin, uh, the great architect of communism. Adolf Hitler, um, you know, the Chancellor of the Third Reich. And then, of course, you've got, from recent history, Osama bin Laden. So, um, when you look at the sheer size and scope of legacies, it can seem overwhelming. All those that we, I put up there seem overwhelming, like... How? How can I have that side, that kind of impact? How am, am I capable of that kind of legacy? Um, think about it, though. All these individuals that I mentioned didn't start out with intent of, I want to leave a legacy. Okay? They just started out doing what they like to do, or doing what they love to do. Muhammad Ali, or excuse me, Joseph, Stalin. I'm sorry, I'm way off here. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. They just wanted to be treated the same, right? Um, Muhammad Ali, he just wanted to box. All right, he wanted to be the, he wanted to be the greatest. He even said it. Um, Earnhardt, he just wanted to race and win. And he did lots of things to do that. You know, some things that weren't always right. But uh, Elvis, Johnny Cash, Aretha Franklin, they just wanted to sing. They just wanted to be the best they could be. They, that's what they'd love. Uh, they started out with that, doing what they love, what they desire. Now, not all of us have been called to leave that size of legacy in history. Um, but most of us have been called to leave a much more important legacy and lasting legacy. Again, don't confuse size or prominence for the importance of a legacy. Um, you know, here's some that you, probably, you all probably don't recognize, um, legacies. Legacy of Pat and Faye George, Pete and Mary Meal, Cindy Myers, or Jim and Carrie Meal. Those are legacies that are important to me. And I'm sure all of you have ones that are, that nobody will ever know their names other than you. Um, they, these, these legacies had a direct and a very important impact on me. Um, as, as my legacy unfolds, as my story unfolds here in a little bit, you'll understand why these legacies had more impact on me than all the celebrities and all the athletes in the world. Um, so let's look at what a legacy is. So, of course, I went to the, the dictionary, the Webster Dictionary, and found these. And um, These are the three that came out. Uh, gift. Is, or a, de a legacy is a gift by will, especially of money or other personal property, something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past, relating to, associated with, and carried over from an earlier time, technology, business, etc. Wow, lots of big words and ones that I want to break down a little bit. 
So, if you, the one that I want to look at, and the ones that I would replace, um, the second one would probably be the closest one that I would have. Uh, something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or a predecessor from the past. Um, but I would replace something with life lessons. And life lessons, teachings, morals, and instructions. And I would replace transmitted, which to me, that just seems like a clinical and very sterile and just not a very intimate uh, word for what we're dealing with. Uh, with. I would replace that with passed on. And the last one, I would also change ancestor to family member. And I would add mentor to it. And we'll get into that later. Um, so it would look like this here. It would... Um, it would be oops, life lessons, teachings, morals, instructions passed on by or received from an ancestor, from a family member or mentor or predecessor or from the past. So, um, so right now I'm going to go ahead and tell a little bit of my story um, and kind of understand hopefully where how I took some legacies, some ideas and some things from my past, combine them together to create what, what I want my family to, to see. Um, but before I do that, I have to have a disclaimer that uh, as I tell my story, the, uh, I'm going to use, I had several mothers in my life. And when I say mom or stepmom, um, that's in, in, in clarification only. Um, not necessarily important. So, as you see that, you'll, you'll understand. So, in 1975, I was born to James and Cindy Meal, a long time ago. Uh, about a year, a year and a half later, my brother George was born. And, unfortunately, before too long, my dad and mom were divorced. Um, years later, I asked my dad, why? Why did you guys get divorced? And he, he told me, um, he was hesitant. And, uh, but he, he put it in a way that my uh, teenage self could hand, would understand it. And he said that uh, they were divorced because my mom was seeing other people while he was supporting the family. Um, so as time went on, my dad, uh, my dad got remarried to my stepmom, Carrie. Um, and that's when the real trouble began when my sister Mary was born, not long after. And then my, my dad and my stepmom raised me and my brother. Uh, you know what? Right now, I'm going to share a couple pictures of my, my brother and my brothers and sisters. Sister. So, first one is my brother George. Yeah, try eating at a family table with that, okay? And try getting food from him. Uh, then my sister. What sister doesn't think that she's a princess, right? All right? That's just... That's who she was. Um, and then my other brother, Barry, who was uh, my, mo my mom and stepdad's son. I never know whether to take him serious or just kind of ignore him a little bit. Um, and of course, they always remind me that I'm the oldest. So, so uh, just a little bit of humor there. And, but uh, going back to my story... Uh, my, my, dad's mom, my dad's family and my mom's family were pretty much two sides of the same coin. They both valued time. They both loved uh, valued time, hard work, and love. But they had different ways of showing it and different ways of ex ex um, expounding on it, I guess. Um, because of this, I had lots of wide ranges of experiences. So... Um, each side of the family had different ways to celebrate. And my dad's side, when the family got together, you know, he had the family reunions and everything. I think, you know, that this side I would consider the Christian side, the safe side. Um, but whenever we got together, you know, my, my grandma, I remember she was the first one, my grandma Mary, that uh, taught me Jesus loves me and the man who built his house upon a rock. Um, and when we'd get together for family reunions, there wouldn't be anything crazy. Probably the craziest thing would be who can swing the highest on the swing in my dad, grandpa's backyard without breaking it. Okay, that was a key. There was always one. It was usually broken. 
or how many oatmeal no-bake cookies we could eat. Um, now, on my, da- on my mom's side, that was a little bit different. Um, you know, we'd have visitations with them every other weekend with my mom, and we'd always have gather- family gatherings and stuff, and it usually involved some sort of motorized vehicle. Okay, dune buggies, four-wheelers, snowmobiles, uh, motorcycles, whatever. Um, and whenever that happened, there was always, of course, food and drinking of the alcoholic kind. And um, So that was the different side of it. Now, again, both these families valued time. They knew how important it was. They just had different ways of exploring it. So as I grew up, the, these polarizing families offered different experiences, uh, and, I, and I embraced them all in different times of my life. So, fast forward a few years. In the early 90s, my mom moved to the big town of Waterloo, Indiana. And, uh, yeah, big town. In the summer of 92, I spent the entire summer down with my mother. Even got a job. And uh, at the end of the summer, I asked my dad and stepmom if I could stay for the school year and finish school out there. I only had a year, two years left in my high school career. And... Uh, you know, as your teenager self, as all of us went through that teenage years, we knew, we, we had it figured out. We knew what we had to do. We knew what the right thing to do, and we had all the answers. And uh, so, and I'm having a few. Um, so, I knew that living with my mom would give me some opportunities that I didn't have before. Uh, a little more freedom, a little more things that uh, I could do. But each time... Each time, every time, there'd be, I'd try and expand and just kind of put myself out there. And there's a voice, three voices in the back of my head. My dad, my stepmoms, my grandmas going, really? Do you really want to do that? Is that what you really want to do? Um, now, I, I do have to have one, uh, have a disclaimer here. There was some underlying uh, reason why I wanted to stay in Indiana for the, for the remainder. And she's back there, and it's her fault that I'm here. So it's Crystal, my wife. So um, we weren't dating at the time, but it didn't take long after that uh, we started dating, and uh, the rest is history. Long history. Anyway, um, as years went on, I graduated from high school from DeKalb, and uh, on July 16th, 1994, we got married. It's 25 years ago. So here in another, what, nine days? No. 11 days, 25 years. So, as you can see, um, one of us aged much better than the other, and it was not me. So, um, so um, about a year and a half later, I felt that uh, we'd only been, we hadn't been married that long. And I felt that we were struggling. Crystal and I were struggling. Now, when I tell this part of the story, she, Crystal goes, I don't remember it that way. Well, I did. I felt it that way. I felt like we were, we were on the verge. We were going to be getting a divorce. I thought, no, this, is, this isn't right. Um, so I remember sitting in a McDonald's parking lot and having this discussion with Crystal. I thought it was done. Okay? And as time would have it and God would have it, uh, Crystal... We had been having some troubles conceiving, and God said, all right, it's time. You're ready. Um, and we, you know, she told me that uh, we were getting, she was pregnant, and that was it. Now, at this point, I knew, deep in my heart, with all the morals and the lessons and everything that my dad and uh, grandparents and everybody taught me, I knew that it was not the right thing to do to leave. So I stayed at the time, I stayed for the kid. who wasn't even born yet. Um, I didn't want to be that guy that said, yeah, I'm done, just, just go away. Um, so, I didn't know it at the time, but that was the beginning of the legacy. That's when I stood up and I said, drew the line in the sand and said, this is what I'm going to do, this is how we're going to do it. Um, I'm not going to live that way, I'm not going to leave my kid, my wife. Um, so... Not long after, it was May of 96, rededicated my life to Christ, uh, along with Crystal at the same time. And uh, 
1996, October of 96, Acacia was born, my oldest. And as young parents, of course, we made mistakes, uh, but we fought through them. There were some financial issues and some other things like that. Um, between the years of 97 and 2000, Chris and I attempted, and we, we had trouble conceiving again. Um, but to expand our family, we'd always wanted four kids. We knew that. We knew we wanted four kids. We, and we, wanted, we even talked about it, three biological and one adopted. Well, that was our plan. Uh, that was not God's plan. Um, and we attempted and you know, had, through that time, but, but in October of 2000, October 24th, 2000, my world changed forever. Um, I remember Crystal coming and talking to me at work. Um, I got a page over to the PA and uh, my boss told me, hey, your wife's up front and he'd talk to you. I remember going out in the front, front walkway and she told me that at 9.38, my mom was killed in a car accident. Um, this wasn't the first time that I'd lost somebody. But definitely the hardest. Um, There's not a day that goes by that you know, I don't see something or, or uh, reminds me of her. Um, one thing that helped me through that, though, in, in, the, in the months leading up to that time, six months, nine months, my mother had been going through a rough patch. Um, I had visited her many times in the ER because she thought that the, uh, the world would be better without her. Um, but during this time, I was able to speak to her, talk to her about Christ, talk to her about the fact that there's more to it than what she's got. Um, and during that time, she accepted Christ into her life. She, we went to church for her. Uh, she even came to the same church, and it, it was a good time. Um, even when I was living with her and my stepdad, we'd never been that close. Um, one thing that my mom had was a hard time showing us, my brother and I, how much she loved us. She really struggled with that. But during this time, I learned that and I understood where, where she was coming from. So as some time passed, uh, Chris and I decided, all right, you know what, we're having trouble conceiving. We're going to go ahead and start the adoption process because... Um, that's what we'd always talked about it, and this is the step we're going to take. So, um, we stepped out of faith when we started. We literally started with tax money one year for the, for the application process. Um, we stepped out on faith, and we knew that this was something that the Lord, the Lord wanted us. Everything was paid with yard sales, gifts, tax returns. We had to take a loan out at one time, but you know what? Sabby came home. Now... When we picked up Savvy, Savvy on our little Haitian sensation, it was all worth it. Um, yeah, if anybody knows her, she's very, um, when she's in the room, you know she's in the room. That's just, that's just the best way to put it. Um, so, one thing that during this time, and we never understood until after, after this event, but several years later, I believe it was in 2008, I think. We brought Sabby home in 2005. In 2008, Haiti had a major earthquake. Um, and by the counts of the Haitian government, there was 300,000 people killed. And not long after that, there was a, a hurricane that hit along with the, the previous earthquake. So I, that number I couldn't find. But I always wonder, because at the time there was a big push for people to adopt from Haiti. Not just us, but others. I always wonder, would Savvy be alive? Is that why all these kids were being adopted? Because the Lord knew. But closer to home, I knew that Savvy would be ours. She was ours, and our family would not be the same. Um, but unfortunately, before we could bring Savvy on a home, um, we had another, Chris and I had another tragedy that we had to fight through. Um, another family member that we lost. And this one... Crystal's mother, Pat, um, she passed away. And uh, I remember her getting up in church and walking back to the bathroom and all of a sudden things were going on. And 
Um, they were rushing her to the hospital and she had a brain aneurysm and three days later she went to be with the Lord. Now, she, her legacy still moves on because I would not be as strong a Christian right now because she's the one that invited us, Chris and I, to church and continued to invite us to church until we said, yes, we're going, okay, stop asking. Um, and... Would I have become? Would have everything kicked in? You know, the lessons and the, the you know from my dad and stepmom, absolutely. But I'm not sure if they would have kicked in as quickly, or we'd have made that decision as quickly. So um, her legacy still carries on, and uh, so so in 2007, almost two years after we brought Savvy home, Crystal comes out on the on the porch as I'm cooking the burger, cooking burgers for dinner. That's how I remember things with food, and. Uh, she said, hey, I, I could tell she was just kind of being cautious or something. I could tell she wanted to ask me something. I'm like, what do you want to talk about? She goes, hey, I need you to run to the CVS and get another pregnancy test. I'm like, what do you mean another one? She goes, I already took one and it's positive. I'm like, okay, that's a surprise because it had been nine years of trying and with nothing. So... Um, so I did, and nine months later, um, little Miss Jamesy was born. And she was born on July 3rd. If anybody knows her, um, you know that she is a little firecracker. So the timing is perfect for her. Um, she definitely keeps you on your toes. Um, similar fashion, about two years later or so. I was at work, though, this time, and Crystal calls me, which she hardly ever calls me. Called me, even back then, she texted, you know, on the flip phone where you got to... You know, you got to hit the button three times and everything like that. But um, So she called me, and I'm like, wow, that's weird. So I'm in the middle of a plant, and it's loud. So I told her, hey, let me get back to my desk, and I'll call you. And she told me she needed to pick me up. I need to pick up another pregnancy test. And nine months later, that's when I got rid of the mattress, by the way. <laughs> the mattress at home. I said, ah, that one's going away. And literally that day, I went home and got a new mattress. Anyway, because that was four, and we were done. Um... The Lord won four, that's what we got. So, um, so as our families got older, um, there were decisions we had to make. Things that went, that our parents, we didn't always agree with our parents, our parents didn't always agree with us, but um, we had to decide what was right for our family. The family that we were raising and um, the legacy that we wanted. Now, there are times we had differing opinions of parents, grandparents, Speaking of which, um, most of you that know me know I don't usually have a problem speaking my mind. Um, I have gotten better over the years, believe it or not. I'm a little more uh, political about it sometimes, but not political. That's the word I'm looking for. A little bit softer, I guess. But my mom and my grandma on my mom's side had no problem speaking their mind. And sometimes that worked. That was some consternation, you know, some issues and stuff that Crystal and I fought through. And I spoke up a few times to my grandma, and it was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever had to do. Um, early on, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted Crystal to stay home with our kids. And the Lord blessed us. We had to struggle. We did without things. Um, and there are times we had to say no to things. Uh, we never always, you know, not always had the nicest things. We never, hardly, we never had a new car. Um, we've had, during, during the adoption process, Chris, we got, I think it was four. We were given four cars. As one died, another one rolled into the driveway. It was crazy. So we didn't have to have a car payment during that time, which helped quite a bit. But, uh, so as I was growing up, my adult life, and, and now, there were, were many examples of legacies that I could follow. Not all of them good, not all of them bad. If you would have asked my teenage self if I would have changed things, I would have absolutely in a heartbeat said, yes, I don't like this, I don't like this, I want to do this, I want to do that. Um, but now, looking back, now don't get me wrong, there are things that I wish did not happen. Death, um, problems conceiving, financial issues. But I know that if any one thing would have changed... I would not have the blessings, the family, the kids that I would have right now. Knowing that, I wouldn't change anything. Um, 
At this time, I'd like to invite somebody out on the stage who has, uh, in, in proud to know, called brother, someone that, uh, realized he needed to change his legacy. He needed to um, make a change and make a decision. So, Wayne Crystal, would you come out, please? That's it? No. Okay. All right. Um, so, thanks, Wayne, for coming out. I know this is a... Um, ask a few questions. and um, So, first one. First of all, would you mind sharing some of the events of the last year and a half in your life? <clears throat> um, a year ago in November... Um, well, to explain a year, the last year and a half, I kind of go, got to go yep. back. Um, I, uh, when I got back out of the army, I got into drugs and got addicted to crystal meth and pills and all sorts of things. And so, drug my wife and young kids through it all. And a year and a half ago, uh, in November, it's a little over a year and a half now, but November of 2018, uh, we went to Michigan to a place called Teen Challenge uh, as a year live-in program. Um, and graduated in November. Um, that was, for me, tough. It was a lot easier for Lisa and the kids because they knew where I was. They knew um, it was safe. Um, a little bit ago, you said uh, drawing a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. I yep. kind of got to that point where um, I knew I couldn't keep going and doing the things I was doing. I didn't want, one, I didn't want my son to grow up and be anything remotely like I had become. And two, I didn't want my daughters growing up and marrying somebody like somebody like me so at at that point you know sitting there and reflecting and a leg, legacy became a big deal to me I didn't have and a father figure I didn't have that good legacy to pass on to them but uh, grandpa's not here this morning but I do have a grandpa that I've got big shoes to fill in the future to carry on his legacy. Um, but, uh, you know, it, change in my legacy is, it's hard some days, but today is easier than two, three years ago of knowing where we're at. And, where we're going, uh, sending our kids down the right, right path. Yeah. So that rolls into the, the next question. How does your how different does your legacy look today than it did a year and a half ago? Again, my kit. It goes back to my son and doing things with him now that is so much more meaningful. Uh, just taking the time to do things with him. Before it was, I was always out doing my thing, um, being selfish. And now appreciating the time that I have with him and just instilling in them good things. That and and reading this with them and praying. The girls pray too, but Reese is a little prayer machine. Like he is <laughs> just his prayers are so. At for he just turned to eight Friday, and to think some of the prayers he prays like well right before we eat. Um, just knowing that. That he wouldn't probably be like that in another ten years, because if I was still going the same way, now that 
now that I'm involved in day-to-day yeah. things with them. Yeah. I, when I got back home, Lisa's been working, and before I started here, uh, I was at home all day with them and just being a dad that I never was. And I'll tell you what, moms have a tough, tough job. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <clears throat> so you're saying we should appreciate everything they yes, do? Okay. Yes, okay. yes, okay. It's, okay. So, to me, my legacy that I'm leaving, um, I want to read Proverbs, the first half of Proverbs 13, 22. A yep. good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I never thought a whole lot about leaving something to my kids, let alone their kids or their kids. But now... I don't have, I don't have to be that. What society labels a drug addict? Like my kids can see past that and see the change of who I was to who I'm becoming, and yeah. make better decisions than I did down the line. Yeah. Cool. Last question. And this one's kind of open ended here for you, so it's all, all yours. Right. What is one thing that you can tell us that you learned? that could help someone that wants or needs to change their legacy? First and foremost, trust God. Um, Trust His process. You know, it's not a snap of a finger. I mean, He can can make it that way, but usually when it's that way, you're not, it's like, you're not going to learn to appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's you go back to uh, the potter and the pottery wheel there's a whole bunch of pushing and tearing and sometimes he's got to tear it all the way down to remake it and that's that's how my process has been it wasn't easy Lisa can tell you that for any of us Uh, but again this side of things is so much easier than the years before for them and and for me. Um, yeah, just trust God and trust His process and submit to His will for your life. Um, and that's that's tough to to surrender and hit your knees and yeah. and uh, especially when when you're talking like drugs and stuff like that because yeah. it, it'll get a hold of you. And, but. Um, any any form of addiction it don't even have to be drugs any form of addiction is a tough yep. thing to submit yep. to God that's um, submitting to God but um, also if you need help submitting to others telling them hey yeah. this is the issue yeah. Yeah. So, so and that that was a tough thing for me too I had a bunch of guys sitting here reaching out to me and I kept pushing away and pushing away I didn't think anybody could understand uh, what I was going through, and you know, come find out. You know, I had a mentor this whole time. He's a wrestling coach, and kept pushing him away, and that's that was tough. But at the end of the day, he's still there, and yep. So, yeah, just reach out to somebody and... Awesome. Anything else? You got anything else? No, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks good. for hey, listening. Thanks for sharing, buddy. Yeah. So, you know, it's easy to say, hey, I got a great start. I got a great legacy. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it going, Awesome. But there are times we have to change our legacies, and, and sometimes you've got to put it in perspective. So uh, let's look at Psalm 1, uh, 127, 1 and 2 right now. Excuse me, just one. I've got my notes. I, I dropped two off. So anyway, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. So in, in verse 1, it states, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builder is wasted. 
Let's face it, as Wayne said, if the Lord's not in it, it's not worth it. Okay? Um, the, as we work, as we look at building our legacies and our families, we need to keep the Lord at the center of it all. So this is where I kind of, this analogy and some different things. Houses are built one board at a time, right? You've got to have a good foundation, which is uh, very imperative. Um, but before they build, you build anything, what do you got to have? You've got to have a blueprint, right? You've got to have an idea what the end result's going to be. Anytime you build something. Um, trust me, with the profession that I'm in, I've seen some doozies of sketches on napkins, um, coffee filters, all kinds of stuff. But there's always an idea. Um, so, legacies are built the same way. Your blueprints are the life lessons, same way we talk, life lessons, teachings, morals, and instructions that you want to be known for, that you want to pass on to your kids and your grandkids. Um, the foundation, of course, is the Lord. Um, the boards, the wires, the plumbing, all the rest of the material um, are the experiences, activities, um, events that shape your legacy. The decisions you make every day. Every day. It's not just something you can say, you know what, I want to be known for this, and then it just happens. You have to know what the end result is, and every day you have to make a decision to do that. Um, now, if you've ever built a house, you know that it never goes as planned. Never. Anybody building a house right now that is frustrated? with some of that, or have built houses in the past going, oh my gosh, why this, why that? Um, I can tell you some stories about, we didn't build our house, but it was, it was modular, but just dealing with the, the, some of the other issues, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, so those are decisions, when, when you have those things that pop up that you're not expecting, you know, um, those, that's when you have to decide and go, okay, we have to stop, reconvene, and go forward. Um, Psalms 127, 3 through 5. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Children are born to a young man. Are, children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. So let's look at a gift. A gift is a thing given willingly to someone without payment. A reward is a thing given to, in recognition to one's service, effort, or achievement. So looking at this verse and what, what those two mean is, our children are given to us willingly. We, no payment is expected. The Lord gives them to us and he goes, you know what? You deserve it. I struggle with that. Do we really deserve those blessings? Uh, do we really... Are we really um, ready when the kid comes along? No, we have no idea when that first child comes along. By the third or fourth, you know, you've seen those pictures where they're just kind of, you know, all over the place and nothing really matters. But, uh, but a reward is given for our service. What did we do to deserve it? What did we do to deserve that? Um, so, with children are like arrows... Um, joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Let's see here. Yep. Um, when you go hunting or target shooting, do you bring extra arrows with you? I personally don't bow or crossbow hunt, but I do um, shotgun, muzzle loader. And of course I bring extra because I'm not that great of a shot. Okay? That's just how it is. And... Uh, so when you're, if you have one arrow, you're out target practicing, you got one arrow, you got to shoot it, go get it, and bring it back, right? That's kind of silly. But if you have, a, if your quiver's full of arrows, you can shoot as many as in that quiver, or shotgun shells, or whatever, and until you're done, and then go get them. So let's look at that in a manner of how you, how your legacy can affect people around you. Um... If it's just yourself, the red guy there, you got, it's just you. You can affect the people that are around you, and that's it. But if you instill your life lessons, your legacy, your, your, all those things on your kids, 
how many more people can they, you know, share and, and uh, give them experiences? Now, each of our kids have different talents, too. So that's a whole other realm of area that, me personally, I, I am not a artist. I'm not a real good sports person. But I've got kids that are good at both of those. And they're be able to touch and influence people that I would never be able to. Um, so the question is, when you look at your kids, do you look at them as just, yeah, they're kids, they're just whatever. Or do you look at them as gifts and things that you can return to the Lord and things that you can work, they can be used for, their, for the building of his kingdom? Um, I do want to say something else, too. Uh, in the verse, it says, talks about children. Does it mean it's biological only? No, no. Um, there are those who have been called and given the opportunity, uh, blessing to love on, pour into, and mentor kids that were not their own biologically. Um, in non-traditional ways, such as adoption, fostering, stepchildren, which I just like that statement um, because... There's someone that came into my life, um, and she knew that my dad, my brother, and myself were a package deal. Um, and she didn't hesitate to step up. When I was younger, I didn't give her, I didn't realize or appreciate how much she set aside for us. Um, but now, again, as I've grown up, I realize how much she loves us. Um, when she introduces us, my brother and I, it's my sons, not my stepsons or Jim's sons, who's my dad. Um, so it, if you're a step parent, treat those kids as if they're your own. Don't look at them and go, yeah, those are my wife's kids. No. Or, or husband's kids. Um, that's not the, you have a, such a huge impact, positively or negatively, on those kids. Um, I hate the there's people at work that, yeah, my wife's kid did this and my wife's kid that did that. And I just, I look at them and I ask them, seriously? You're living with them. They're living with you. Those are your kids. They look up to you whether you believe it or not. Um, so another group that, of people that are able to, are called on to uh, nourish and, and love those kids that are not theirs. Um, teachers, youth group leaders, coaches, Sunday school teachers. Um, those of us that have been given the privilege, tremendous opportunity. And it's so important to have that your kids get other experiences from other people. Um, it's not, and you can choose those. You can say, you know what, I like the, you know, this guy here or this, young, this lady here that they're going to believe the same things and they're going to teach the same things that my kids do. But sometimes them hearing out other parents or other people is... You could be telling the same thing. And they hear it from somebody else and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. Um, I think we've all experienced that as, as parents. Um, and sometimes you, and, and having you know, raised a teenager and in the middle of a teenage right now, they're not going to talk to you about stuff that are deep down things that they're ashamed of. They're going to go and talk to these coaches, these teachers, these Sunday school teachers. You have to give them outlets um, for that. So in closing, um, I just have, you know, whenever I'm talking with somebody at work and working with them and uh, how to um, be a better employee or a better person, um, I like to ask questions to them. So here's, here's some questions that I want to ask you guys. And trust me, when I was writing these down, this whole, this whole thing hit me just as much, hopefully, as it hit you. So, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? Who left you a legacy? Your father, your grandmother, your grandparent? Teacher, coach, youth group leader? So what if you made some mistakes? What if you feel that your legacy is not going the way that you want it to? What do you do? Find somebody. Um, ask them. 
Um, is it too late to change your legacy? No. Wayne said that. Wayne uh, talked to us and he said, you know what, I realized it was not going the way I wanted it to and I want to change. Um, so he got the help that he needed with the support system that he had. Um, so, but doing that, changing your legacy is one decision at a time. It doesn't take, it, as he said, it's, it's a gradual thing. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen maybe in one generation, but you have to uh, move on and you make that decision each day. Um, sometimes you get your legacy back on track, you get your family back on track, you be the man, the woman, the child of God that you want to be. It takes strength, courage, and time. And thankfully, we have grace. We've been given grace. We can make that change. Um, I make mistakes every day. Um, but the Lord loves us enough that he uh, gave us the opportunity to repent. Um, now, last one. I believe each of us have been given a legacy. Each of us have... Um, we have to, we've been given le many legacies, and we have to decide which one do we want to do. Do we take the one from here, or do we take the one from here? Do we take those two and blend them together? Make our own. You know, that's what's the beauty of this is um, as long as the Lord's in it, he's going to bless it. Um, so, all right, I lied. One more thing. Always be the real you. One thing that um, I've learned growing up, and is you can't be one person at church. You can't be one person at work. You can't be one person with one group of friends. You have to be the real you because if your kids are watching you, and they are, they're watching you. I, you know, I've still got two little ones that are, I say little, but they're 11 and 8. Um, they're just watching you. So if I'm a different person over here and over here, they're going to get confused. You have to be the real you everywhere you go. Um, so, that's it. Thank you for your time. Um, is that clock right? Wow, that went longer than I thought it would. But I knew I would be done by 1 o'clock because the NASCAR race got postponed to today at 1. So I, was, I knew I was going to be done by then. But anyway, so uh, if you would stand, I'll close in prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day you've given us um, to gather together um, and, and worship and learn from you and just uh, understand that... Uh, Everything we do, everything that uh, we say uh, should be the glory, for the glory of you. Uh, and there's people watching. Uh, it's important that we, we uh, just live for you and that we carry out our, our lives. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.